definitely appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, can you guys raise your hand if you're here today to get extra credit in one of your classes? Let's just be honest. Do you? So can you talk to my, I was not a very good student. Can you call my professors from college retroactively and get me credit for being here today? There is hope for you if you're a C student. Um, yeah, this is a talk that's evolved a bit. Uh, at first, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a well-known entrepreneur in my field, and you know, initially this talk used to be just talking about business stuff. Um, if you want to be a game developer, the truth is, like, I love video games as much as you do, Mr. Resident Evil 4 t-shirt guy. But, uh, you know, raising capital, running a company, dealing with political fallout, all that is most of what consumes my day. Uh, you know, so what we're going to do is kind of talk a bit about my company, how we get started, and then we're going to get into the gamer game stuff, which is kind of horrific. So, um, I guess there's no better way to start than, um, this is the trailer for a game that came out last year. It's called Revolution 60. So I'm just going to play our trailer and let you guys see it. Men, my friends are dying. It would do a lot for my morale if I understood what they were dying for. This is the mission briefing I received before we went second. Your mission is to infiltrate N3 on 3. Our location and task control to just If you fail this mission, it will be in all of the new and the final. So, if anyone is the commander and I'm known as the what do you do? I'm an assassin. My specialty is going to be more combat. I can see where that would come in handy out here in the lack of space. You're pretty calm for someone that just lost a war with your team. If I felt anything when I lost personnel, I wouldn't make a very good commander, but I. It's a mission all day. It's not personal. Don't leave me like this, Father. I'm broken. Do you hear me? I'm broken. You want the easy out. You're scared. You're still an agent of Chester. When this is over, we'll find a way. And until then, I'm ordering you to fight this. I can't. Where? They're there. And we're down here. If you come at me, you better be ready to kill. So, are there guys in chessboard, or is it like an all girl thing? <laughs> so, that's our game, Revolution 60. Um, it's kind of an interesting story behind it. Um, you know, I'm a pretty well known tech fan. And what the game has is basically this five women playing every single role of the game. So what you have is when you, know, you have women in the part of villainous, commander, hero, sidekick, women playing every single role, it kind of frees you up. So from this feminist point of view, it's very interesting to play the game and kind of analyze these friendships and situations when, you know, they're basically, um, there is an age of this. So this is a uh, feedback I get tremendously since we're losing our game. Um, we are changing the costumes for the PC version and to update it. So uh, what we've heard overwhelmingly from people is they want armor. You know, uh, they kind of want, they didn't like the Barbie doll look at the game. I could get into a long engineering description about how it was a poly count issue to give them form fitting outfits and how we invested a lot of our resources in there, but uh, I will just say that's going to be changing <laughs> coming forward. So, uh, you know, the mission of Giant Space Guy is very, very uh, simple. You know, what we've seen uh, in my lifetime is uh, just an explosion in the number of women in the game. Uh, in 1989, they did a study to figure out how many, what percent of gamers were women. It was only 3% in 1989, according to that study. Uh, as of 2008, it was 11%, if I remember correctly. And as of this year, it was 49% of gamers are women. So, um, you know, we're here, we're getting the game, just like everyone else does. Uh, I bet if I talk to the women out here in the audience, you've all got games on your phone right now. We are all gamers these days. But one of the, the main problems that we have is video games are an overwhelmingly male-dominated field. I can tell you, I just got back from GBC, which is one of the biggest professional conferences in the entire world on this subject. You're talking to men 
all week long. It's men making the games, designing the games, funding the games, managing the games, reviewing the games. So what you kind of have more and more is this real disconnect between the people that are making the games and the people that are actually playing the games. And if you listen to the consumer, um, you know, women are very frustrated with being this over-sexualized damsel in stress. You know, women play games for different psychological reasons than men do. Um, you know, yes, some of this, these are very general statements, and you know, there are women that like gears more in Call of Duty, but very generally speaking, women tend to like near the war. You know, women tend to like stories versus just mindless violence. Women, I can point you to studies that show we don't particularly care about score. Uh, so it's just an entirely different set of things that women are looking for from games. And you know, my mission here is it's um, feminist idealism. You know, I'm a cold-hearted capitalist, and I see people out there really failing to make games that are meaningful for women. I think that we want different game types beyond you know, match three gems on your phone. So, um, you know, we are basically, I, I'm not a genius. I just hired a bunch of women to work at my company, and uh, you know, we put together games. Uh, our first one came out, uh, it's Revolution 60, it's very much a story-based game. Uh, we have one coming out soon. Uh, this is a game where young girls has messages that they can be engineers, and we've got a lot of other stuff coming in the pipeline. I gotta tell you guys right now, uh, we have a game coming out soon where there's gonna be no violence and you are in a spaceship that's plummeting down to Earth. And we should be able to hire one that, if I told you her name, you probably know her name. Uh, we have really good games who are working with us on casting and stuff like that. So it's just gonna be two people talking to each other. We're gonna go beyond the dialogue wheel. And like they're working to save the spaceship, it's, it's crashing to stop them from dying. And, you know, there's no gunplay, there's no violence, there's no murder here. It's just like a social situation. So, that's what we're doing. And yeah, this is very simple. Uh, when Nintendo came out with the Wii, uh, they employed what they called the Blue Ocean Strategy. This is a holdover from Japanese management. The idea is, uh, in business, there are red oceans and there are blue oceans. Red oceans are established areas. So in the game development industry, this would be first-person shooters, this would be Call of War, this would be Gears of War, um, this would be Assassin's Creed. These are game types that are established. We know that they make money, we know that players like them. Blue Ocean, the Blue Ocean strategy is to look at places we haven't gone yet, and to try to make games for, every, for places that basically oceans haven't been fished yet. So that's simply the, the mission of Giant Space Cat. Like, uh, if you're a gamer, uh, the way we've handled dialogue has barely changed since the 1980s. Uh, in the 80s, I would play text adventures where I was growing up. We would pick one of three options to see what you wanted to set. You know, today we have the dialogue wheel, which is like pick five options. So, you know, it's, it's barely evolved. And you know, we want to go in new directions and learn new things. Um, like I said, uh, Revolution 60 was a very ambitious game for a team our size. We made it for half a million dollars, and we took four Game of the Year awards. Uh, I've never developed a game before this. This was my very first game out of the gate. It was a massive success financially. You know, some of the reviews. For instance, Serenity Caldwell, she's one of my idols in the tech world. You know, Kotaku just um, gave us fantastic uh, reviews. And it's because we were a very cinematic game. Um, you know, even our characters were sexy. You know, I realize in retrospect that was a mistake, but you know, we always treated them as people. You know, the camera doesn't stare at Holiday's butt or boobs. You know, it's always looking her in the eye, and the focus on is on what she's feeling or what the person next to her is feeling. So you know, this isn't complicated. It's just treat the people in the game like they're human beings. This is one of the, uh, the quotes from our game review that I just really, really love. Does anybody else here play Final Fantasy VIII by any chance? Yeah! Great game. Love Final Fantasy VIII. And you know, they're basically talking about how, as they played our game, they felt so drawn into the world because we really prioritized facial animation, hair animation, story. Um, and they just really got drawn into it. I mean, really, really complimented about this. So what happens when a team of women release a well reviewed cake? Um, it was awful. We got, I got great threats from the very beginning. Um, 
you know, the truth is, you know, if you come over to my house, like I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of games. I've been gaming since the 80s, like everyone else. Um, you know, I don't want to take away anyone else's games. I just want to go make new things. If you want to buy Call of Duty, it's fine. You can play Dead or Alive, it's fine. We're just going in a different direction. And like, the response that we get from that, it is, it's, it's truly baffling to me. People feel like their culture is under attack. And, you know, we have women out there that are just working on these things. Um, you get a tremendous amount of harassment. So I started getting uh, great threats, you know, just being the head of our company uh, as early as 2013, when January 1st has started to pour in, and they've uh, consistently come through. And for whatever reason, just being a woman in this field is very threatening to people. So, you know, this is coming back to it. You know, games are changing right now. This is a really good thing. Um, I could talk more about this, but uh, I'll keep it short so we can get to the gamer game stuff. You know, I am so bored right now with video games. I have been playing games where I just murder waves of enemies since like the 80s at this point. And you know, we don't even think as we play games about how much we assume that violence needs to be the primary mechanic by which you interact with the world. It's really bizarre if you think about it. Like, I started playing Bloodborne uh, two nights ago, and it's just like hack and slash and kill things. And I moved up Final Fantasy, and it's like hack and slash and kill things. And it's like, you know, aren't you guys just bored of that? But, you know, in Star Trek, when they go on the holodeck, like Captain Janeway doesn't just go murder war for, for hundreds of hours. She goes to places, and she interacts with people in like a human way. And she learns things about herself. And I feel like that kind of next generation, like, emotional connection to the games we play, that's what I want. I want to feel connected to story. And I'm so tired of just murdering thousands of people instead. It's not working for me anymore. And then, you know, we have waves of some of the most awesome women working in the field today. You know, this is my game. This is Gemma Hofstein's game. Uh, County Kingdom. Jenna Hofstein is, I would put her up there with Kim Smith, the developer of Portal. She's a game design genius. She's designed games for children. Zoe Quinn, you know, this is a game she worked on called Prey. Um, it's a really, really interesting puzzle game about uh, narrative and interaction. And it's just like, this is a good thing. If you want to go murder people on Xbox Live, that's great. I think that's fine. But we're finding new market because it's more diverse workplaces. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't get into game development to talk about films. I would much rather sit up here and talk to you guys about Unreal Engine, or I'll talk to you about polycount, or rigging issues, or nerves, or, or gameplay ideas, or game design philosophy. This is the last thing that I would like to talk about. But what I found as I, as I got into this field is me talking about feminism and what women here face, this isn't an option for me. This is a question if I get to have a job. This is a question if my game gets reviewed. Like, it is a tremendously difficult field to work in. And every single day, I am just stunned by what I face. You know, Blood War just came out. It's this really difficult hack and slash game. Our entire industry is just completely buzz about it, which is fine, but then you look at who's doing the reviewing of that game, and it's 100% white, straight male dudes. And there's nothing wrong with being a white, straight male dude, but when you have the only people that get to critically evaluate games coming from this perspective, it means our industry only values this one thing. Again, you know, they're talking about this game, and they're not talking about Life is Strange Part 2, which is about a teenage girl. So, you know, these are really big issues. You know, games are not a small industry. It's more money in the movies these days. So where did all this start? You know, Gamer Game, we came to like the false start of it. Uh, I guess officially you can say it started with Zoe Quinn. We'll get into that. But, um, you know, I really, I know a lot about this, and I think it's more accurate to say Gamergate first started with a new Sarkeesian and feminist frequency. Um, I think this was 2012, and you know, Sarkeesian is feminist 
She wants to be a feminist critic, so she starts up a YouTube uh, channel, uh, basically trying to kickstart some feminist critiques of video games. People lose their minds, and they start attacking and, uh, They threaten to rape her, they threaten to murder her, they create video games where you get to beat up Anita. And just from the start, it was just the most hostile, sexist thing you can imagine happening to you know, someone I consider a hero in our field. So, you know, this kind of coalescing of this toxic gamer identity really started with Anita uh, in 2012 with feminist frequency. All right. Um, so, this gamer kind of started bubbling over. It, is, it just all through last year, it started getting just worse and worse and worse. So, in July, this woman has asked me to kind of leave her name out of the press because every time I mention her, she gets a new label of harassment. But this is a friend of mine, a friend of my asymmetric co-host, Maddie Myers. And um, there's a institution in our industry called Giant Bomb. Um, this is a very popular game journalism site. And basically, it is the only 100% straight white male game journalism institution in the entire industry. If you want to hear from a woman, don't go to Giant Bomb because they don't hire any. If you want to hear from someone black, don't go to Giant Bomb because they don't hire any from black. They, it's everybody, it's, it's this one type of thing. It's a very proud culture over there. They were going to hire some new people, and lo and behold, they chose not to diversify their site again. They hire someone that, again, is from this very specific pool. Uh, this person is a, she was a very famous journalist, and she kind of critiqued that decision. And what happened to her? She was bullied out of her industry. They threatened to murder her, they threatened to rape her, they intimidated her, they posted her address, they doxed her. And it's this phenomenon that my friend Peter Cohen, a Massachusetts journalism, calls emotional terrorism. And the idea is to make the person you're targeting feel so under attack that they just give up. It's emotional exhaustion. I go through this. I can tell you it's absolutely horrible to go through. So yeah, this woman is someone who I consider to be one of the brightest, smartest people in her entire industry. And they just harassed her until she left. And you know, speaking for myself, I remember after this happened, like, this is a woman I really care about. I don't want you to imagine that, like having someone you really care about just bullied out of your field for having an opinion, like those people should hire some women, some women. It's, it's, it was just horrible. And I lay awake on the couch for three nights after that. I was just so furious at what was happening to my friend. It just got worse from there. So, right through Shift Revolution 60 last year, Zoe Quinn incident happened. Um, you know, I think it's important as we're talking about this to say, you know, everything I'm going to talk about, these are just allegations against this woman. I don't pay any credence, and I think you should remember that there could be just one person. But basically, what happened with my friend Zoe Quinn, I would say, is the most sexist incident in the entire history of video games. So, Zoe Quinn has an ex-boyfriend. Um, he gets pissed at her and he publishes a blog filled with relentless, ugly allegations of her sex life. Commits a massive violation of, of her privacy and publishes like just pages and pages, biomes, emails, everything. Just opens this woman's life up to non-stop harassment. Zoe Quinn, by the way, was a minor celebrity in Game Dog back then. He, he actually said his purpose was to discredit her professionally. So, you know, then you have basically the same people that harassed man, Samantha, um, I'm sorry, the person I can't say, and um, also uh, Anita Sarkeesian basically like, start making these piece of crap videos attacking her. So I want you to imagine like having someone make these viral videos 25 minutes of lies about your, your sex life, published out there for the world to see. Now I want you to imagine the dude from Firefly is out there promoting it. 
to his hundreds of thousands of followers. I want you to really imagine what that must feel like. These are the same people that threatened to murder my friend Samantha Allen. So this starts happening to my friend Zoe Quinn. And it's, it's just flat out entertainment for these people. Like they're, they're bothered that Zoe Quinn has some ideas that women feel like they're equal in this field. So they start attacking her. Um, this was in GDC that year. I remember as I was going. We actually had people, um, you know, the, the allegation was she slept with five guys. So they're like in a weird t shirt saying, Five guys, so we put them on it to kind of, you know, slut shame her. So, and what happened after that is to start going after people one by one. This is my friend, uh, Jen Frank. Jen Frank is a very famous woman journalist in this field. They were in the clinic. They attacked her, they shamed her, they went through a light, they found things to discredit her by, um, make up allegations, harass, 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 harass. Uh, it's a playbook at this point. She finally gives up. She said, this is not worth it. Quits the industry. Maddie Bryce, one of the very few you know, African-American gay critics, but also a woman. Um, you know, they do the playbook on her. Harass, 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 harass. So the cost is more than she just quits. You know, Lee Alexander, very famous woman journalist in this field, probably the most famous. You know, she writes a column, they don't like it, same playbook, trying to kill her, harass her, attack her. Yeah, you know, she didn't quit, but she sure have stepped out of the spotlight for a long time after that. Catherine Cross, my good friend, uh, you know, she's one of the greatest academic critics in the entire industry. They have doxed her, they threatened to murder her. They uh, threaten to rape her. They gone through the past. It's the same playbook that they keep running against one to, to shut us up. And I have to tell you, for me, these are all women I love and respect. If I do ever end up quitting games, it's not going because of what has happened to me. It's because it takes such a cost to see people that you care about that much terrorized on a daily basis. This is from someone who was speaking during that time here. This is one of the women I just talked about. This is what she said on Facebook just before I got thrown into this. We're not winning. If we do win, it's going to be a pair of victory. We can't even count being able to sleep on our own homes. And she's right. You're really losing at that point. And then they went after me. So this all started for me, and I got dragged into this when a fan of my show, Isometric, uh, which is a gaming podcast on 5x5, we're actually going to be really soon, um, basically took some of my tweets and turned it into a meme. So this is it. Um, I basically tweeted these things about Gamergate. I think these are pretty mild jokes myself. And, you know, this person turns it into a meme and sent them to me. I said, hey, that's really funny. And I tweeted it out. And it all went downhill for me from there. So what happened was uh, 8chan, which is the extremist version of 4chan. So uh, basically 4chan got to the point where they're like, look, we can't have this level of doxing and terrorism and death threats happening with women. Game remains banned on 4chan. The only other thing 4chan bans is child pornography. <laughs> That's how bad Gamergate has gotten. So 8chan is like this radical split-off group of 4chan where everything's on the table. They got to a federal judge a few weeks ago, amazingly. So, you know, basically 8chan doesn't like this tweet and starts going after me. And I'm watching it happen. Uh, so they start going through my life, they start climbing things to attack me with, they start threatening to rape me. The exact same playbook that I had seen them do to all these women. It scared the hell out of me. And I have to tell you, I, I closed up my laptop and I stepped away from the computer for 24 hours. And I realized if I stayed, the same stuff that happened to Zoe Flynn was going to happen to me. And let me tell you, the price that Zoe Flynn had paid was 
hellish. And I really asked myself if I wouldn't stay there and keep doing that. And I thought about it. And I think this is the real moment where you show your hair. And I told myself I was not going to get run out of the industry. I wasn't going to abandon my company that I fought so hard to create. So I came back and I, I tweeted this out. I said, fuck you, HM, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying here, I'm going to keep doing all the games. And within moments, this was sent to me. The dots me, the no one address. Um, Your mutilated corpse will be on the front page of Jezebel tomorrow. There's a jack shit you can do about it. Daddy and kids are going to die too. I don't give a fuck. They're brought to be feminists anyway. Hope you enjoy your last moment's life on this earth. You did nothing worthwhile. And that's why I called the police. And that was the moment I found myself in this national spotlight. Um, for whatever reason, that tweet went viral. One I just showed you. And you know, when we tweeted it out, and I, I found myself at the, the center of this media firestorm. So let me tell you when you're that scared for your life, um, let me tell you about the reason I chose to do media at that point. You know, it comes back to that the, the thing I showed you with my friend saying you were losing game game. The problem is the game industry. Like I said, this is a game industry where all the journalists are men. So IGN had chosen to say nothing about gaming. Giant Marvel had chosen to say nothing about gaming. Your gamer had chosen to say nothing about gaming. And the truth is, our industry is just saying silent. See no evil, hear no evil. Nobody's saying anything. So, you know, I'm a pragmatist and I'm an engineer, so I have one mission to try to pull myself together enough to get people to start talking about what was happening to my friends. So when CNN called me, I said yes. And you can look at that tape, I look like shit. <laughs> my eyes are bloodshot, my hair is a mess, a psychological wreck. I pulled it together, I went on there. I talked to them about what was happening to us. I did interviews with Guardian, CBC, basically all over the world. They kept calling me. And I'm trying to reach inside of myself and find the strength to talk about this. Because you've got to understand, at this point, every, every single woman that works in games is scared to death. I have a really good friend of mine. I'm not going to give you her name. But she's one of my professional idols. And she had a huge opportunity to come and do an entirely new project that would put her in the public eye. And with all this nonsense going on, like she sat out and made her career move because she was scared to death that her children would be targeted. Like this is horrible for every woman. It was just flat out terrorism for all of us. So, you know, when these places started talking to me, I'm like, God damn it. If IGN and Giant Bomb aren't going to talk about this, I'm going to go to the real press. And I'm going to talk about it. And I think I did change the narrative. Yeah, there's this, there's this question that people ask me a lot. There's this assumption that when we're talking about Gamergate, or we're talking about a few bad apples, or we're talking about just some, some gamers that have gone online, and I don't believe that's the problem. I think Gamergate is a symptom <coughs> of culture in games is very, very broken. And I think it starts at the top with the really big game companies, EA, Activision. Yeah, I know these people professionally. And you know, the truth is, games send out messages from the very top. Um, one of the differences in the Atari age and the Nintendo age is Nintendo sat down and very consciously said, we're going to market the Nintendo Entertainment System to boys between 10 and 15. And they made that choice, and that's why they called it the Game Boy when it came out a few years later. And what had happened ever since then, like, the games for the Atari era were a lot more gender neutral. 
the calm doesn't work really have any grown tones to it. <laughs> you know, what happened ever since that moment is the game industry made a choice to start consistently marketing games to men. So what happened is you started to see games change. And you know, like Double Dragon, how does Double Dragon start? Like they walk out and boom, they punch this, you know, this guy and they put the girl over, you know, their shoulder and they walk off. And it's like setting culture from the very beginning of women with pencils in distress. I can name hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of games like that. And the truth is when we play games, you constantly get this message like, hey, you probably do play this game. <laughs> like, enjoy this sexualized woman or enjoy this. And it's the culture from the top down kind of makes this very specific gamer like the center of the entire world and makes him the king. And you see it with the way like our press chose to not cover what was happening to women. And I think what's happened is our culture itself in the game industry is so sexist that I think the, the players playing the games, I think they're just responding to that. I mean, they've been told this is a space for dudes. So when women come along, of course they're going to feel very threatened. So I just be very clear about this. I don't blame Gamergate on HM. I blame it on an industry that's treated every woman here like shit for 30 years, and we'll not talk about it like an adult. <sighs> this is a really hard video to watch. Um, this case is currently being litigated, but then there's some stuff out there in the press. I'm not going to be able to get into it, but I will show you this video. This is a video I received um, probably, I think it was three months ago. So I wonder if you can imagine what it's like having gotten tons of death threats and to have this video sent to you. Oh, you two, you straight right here, and this is my fucking car, or my mom's car, and I'm straight racing, could not perform, couldn't fucking perform alone, and now the bitch shit is crushed, okay, I can't even keep on each other, it's made of bullshit, but I'm just shit, and the laws, I wasn't even fucking drawn, I was just racing,
weapons in his car to shoot me. Someone then sent me repeated death threat videos um, where he was like holding a knife up in the air and saying, I'm going to leap off a building and murder around the Assassin's Creed style. So I want for you to imagine what that's like. That's, that's just one of the 49 pounds. So, you know, from there it goes into, this is one of those real things that are about to be made, like being a care for a law and order. I guess if you're going to be on law and order, at least I'm alive. That's the best way to be on law and order, I think. Not in jail, so. Um, you know, like having this actress read my actual death threats word for word and see a character and see a nomination of me and so we can and be the same thing. Really weird, you know. The woman, based on me, ends up getting sexually assaulted, um, you know, on a rooftop, and then ends up like being intimidated and quits game up. Kind of weird. So, <laughs> this is where we kind of come back for a minute. We say, like, why am I here in the first place? I don't want to be a feminist, you know like analysts, like a new Sarkeesian does. I'm a software engineer. I love them real. I love talking about APIs. I love going to WWBC, talking about new Apple tools with Xcode. You know, I'm a Maya nerd, I'm an unreal expert. You know, like, why? This doesn't have anything to do with shipping games. And, like, I think the question is, like, how does this affect your ability to do your job? Um, this has really hurt my company. And yeah, I would remind you guys, this isn't just about me. There are plenty of people that count on me to be able to pay their rent in my company. So you know, what I've found is I spend so much of my day now in the face of law enforcement, the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, local police, about all these people. And you know, it's just hell. I mean, there's no way to sugarcoat it. You know, to kind of bring it back to the business portion of this, like how does how does being targeted for death and having lots of media and having a law and order episode being made about you? Something people accuse me of all the time is you did this to increase the sales for your game. I'll tell you guys straight up, barely affected the sales for our mission sixty. It's a small uptick that should not for the hell of a look through a financial crisis is my you know, companies have trouble like shipping in games. So you know, that's just absolutely not true. You know, this is a whole different thing, like working with law enforcement. You know, I'm gonna be speaking a lot more about this professionally soon. Um, I can say like the local police have dealt with in Arlington, Massachusetts. They are good people. They are deeply awesome human beings. And something I think about a lot is the psychological toll that these death threats have taken on me. What it must be like to be a police officer where you can get murdered any time, any day. That's got to be really terrible. So, yeah, I'm not attacking the police when I say this, but I can tell you it's very frustrating that, you know, between Zoe Flynn and the Sarkisian and myself, we've had hundreds, hundreds of very specific, actionable death threats. How many prosecutions have there been? Zero. How many people have been arrested or charged with a crime? Zero. What has happened to anyone? Nothing. Has anyone been fired over this? No. Nothing has happened. Even with all the press in the world, there's no one that's done anything. And I've talked about this in media. I have on this computer right here six very well documented cases with names of the people doing this, with their address, with lots of evidence of what they've done to me specifically. And it's just like passing it over to law enforcement. Like, here you go. Here's all the evidence you need. I know this is a crime. We've talked to Daniel Citron. <coughs> you know, and it's just like our law enforcement is not equipped to deal with this kind of cyber terrorism. We have 15,000 FBI agents, as best as I can tell, Despite all the publicity I've got from working with Congress, there is no department of the FBI that is in charge of prosecuting these crimes. This is a really big problem. If you threaten to murder someone, I think you should go to jail. So, 
What else is happening? Sea lion. <sighs> yeah, you can laugh, but I mean, I have 40,000 Twitter followers. I can't post a picture of my dog without being screamed at. It doesn't matter what I say these days. Everything I say is wrong. I'm attacked constantly. It's just, it's very draining. <coughs> you know, this is, um, one of the, the three texts of Gamer Games, they say it's about ethics and gaming terms. Well, this is Diane Newsweek did a few um, months ago, and they looked at it. Okay, Gamergate says it's about ethics and journalism, so who are they tweeting? Okay, um, Kotaku was a journalist of enterprise, or then upset at. Lee Alexander is a journalist, and these are the two journalists that have kind of been accused of ethical violations. Who are they actually going after? <coughs> Zoe Quinn, not a journalist. Me, not a journalist. And Nina Sarkisi, not a journalist. You know, from this study, I was one of the most harassed women on the entire internet from that week. So, you know, in the meantime, my mission is to run GSX and kind of keep my company going. But, you know, I find myself thrust into this position where no one else can act to get these things done. So, you know, you've seen anti-harassment tools unveiled on Twitter. I can tell you we've been in very constant communication with them. You know, I can tell you we're trying to work with Reddit to like, kind of update their policies. Um, you know, I can take time away from my engineering job to write pieces for the media to kind of get the word out. I took time away from my job to come here and talk to you guys today. Um, you know, we've been working with Congress. So, you know, I'm not an idealist. I work with the system I have. I try to be pragmatic, and that's what we're trying to do. Where are we going to go from here? You know, Giant Space Guys can keep making games. I think the best way to win is to get back to making games for women and not letting these people <laughs> shut us up. So, you know, we're working with venture capitalists and other partners, and we're going to. Um, we're going to be massively expanding the studio this year. I'm really excited about it. So, was it worth it? You know, I can't get an answer to that. I mean, the truth is, standing up to Game of Game has, it's cost me sleep. It's cost me standing. I, you know, I feel like I might be a clinical case of PTSD at this point. It's, it's made me feel emotionally numb to like deal with this much garbage coming at me constantly. Um, it's like you kind of throw up a shell so it doesn't affect you and you stop being able to feel things overall. It's it's really been it's been the hardest thing I've ever gone through. But I think the really big question is like, could I have lived with myself if I didn't say that for game or game? I don't I couldn't have, you know. I, I just couldn't set this one out. That's the truth. But, you know, I grew up in Mississippi, um, you know, a state that you know, has famously been described as sweltering with the heat of oppression. You know, it's one of the most famous incidents that ever happened in Mississippi in Kansas Cash. This is uh, kind of the environment of Mississippi. It's a, a state that is really struggling with um, the legacy of racism. And I can tell you, growing up there, it was very apparent to me the racist problems in Mississippi. But you try to talk to people about it the same way I try to talk to people in game now about sexism. And it's just people want to stay silent. They just don't want to address it. They just want to move on. They just want to like, not think about it and then do their thing. And for me, it's the exact same situation. You know, this is uh, the school I went to, the University of Mississippi. This is the Lyceum right there. So when black people tried to enroll there, um, there's actually a riot in the Grove, and the National Guard ended up being called out. So there are actually bullet holes up there in the Lyceum from, you know, you know basically black people just trying to enroll in their schools. You know, I can't help but think that there are a lot of parallels between that and what's happening in the game industry today. So, this is all this today. From just a few years ago, so there's a famous thing to do in the Grove to sit out there, get drunk, and party. I can tell you, like, going to the school and trying to talk to these people, it's exactly the same as game now. Like, you try to say, hey, you know, like, 
you know, black people in Mississippi, they don't really pick cotton anymore, but they do have to, you know, they do mainly work as janitors and like, they're really economically subjugated here. Like, don't you guys see this as problematic? Like, do you think racism is over? People just don't want to talk about it. It happens in the same way technology. Like, I would talk to people, I'd be like, hey, uh, you know, I can't help but notice your, your publication, which is very famous, has 17 out of 18 of your editors are men. Half of gamers these days are women. Don't you think that's kind of a problem? Don't go talk about it. Get to nonsense. <coughs> you know, the truth is, games desperately need a feminist critique. This is from Soul Calibur. This is one of the most popular fighting game franchises. The irony of games is any normal person outside the industry can look at video games and tell you they're sexist. Any, anyone can tell you this, but it's just we don't want to talk about it. The exact same way that you know people don't want to talk about what's wrong in the South. So what is this name for giant space cat? We're gonna keep moving forward. We're gonna keep making games. It's really simple. So I am not going into that's my basic message for that. So I'm going to leave it up with the questions. How much time do I have? Do you know? Um, we have eight minutes. Well, eight, eight minutes? We can just open up for questions now. Yep. Yeah. Let's we'll start up with questions. So. Cool. I noticed as you were talking, you bashed Game of Year a lot. Yep. Yeah. But yet, you didn't talk about what happened to you towards the end, by the anti gamer gate side after you spoke with Brad Rodell. I'm sorry, do you have a question or is this going to be a monologue? Um, why didn't you say anything about what gamer gate has done to forward the positive? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move on from that. Thank you. Oh, why won't you ask them? We, we have. Why won't you ask them? I'm going to move on. Can we okay. go to the question? Which is an independent game that just are right. gaming companies that are doing it. Um, and I find it interesting. That's me, by a woman. But I guess my question would be: uh, I find it uh, funny that a lot of the industry glorifies being a gamer girl and being sure. like a sexy girl that plays games. But once a woman steps into a position of power, it seems to be intimidating. Why do you find that so? I think it's unconscious bias, to be very honest with you. I think people kind of assume, they, they've done a lot of work with this in Google. Um, I can tell you working in this field, everyone agrees intellectually that women should be here. Everyone agrees that women should be free to make games. Um, what, where it's complicated is when it reaches unconscious bias in people's minds. And they have certain ideas of what women can be or what they can't be. So I think when a woman gets into a position of power, it kind of takes away from this unconscious assumption that we have that, you know, like this certain kind of game is the center of the whole world. And I think that's very threatening to people. And, you know, again, the games are changing with 49% of the audience these days. So I don't know why, it's just a thing. So let's go. I, I teach you, <coughs> I teach you, I'm a geology professor, but. I was ignorant of this whole situation, and I'm just wondering, has this ever happened in any other history in, in sort of the, you know, in a historical context? I can't think of any industry where, you know, somebody, a group was attacked simply for, for being a part of that industry. I, I'm sorry, I'm calling you some question? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm saying, has this happened in any other industry? I'm trying to think back, I mean, it's just... Oh, so did my camera I think that it's echoes of a very familiar thing that's happened through history. I mean, growing up in Mississippi, I'd say it's very analogous to that. Or I think you have first or second wave feminism. I can see a lot of similarities here. I think what's different today is with, with the internet. Um, I think what has happened is, I know for me, my feminist consciousness has expanded massively over the last few years. But I also think what's happened is with social media, I think it opens up this door for a certain new kind of terrorism, this emotional terrorism that I'm talking about. So I do think that this is unprecedented 
And the scariest part of Gamergate is how it's expanded into other areas. Um, you know, Gamergate is, uh, they're going out the comic right now. They recently announced Thor and they gave the, the hammer to someone else and now Thor is a woman. You know, there's a new Thor that's come. This is very, very threatening to some people, amazingly. And now Gamergate is coming up for comics creators. So Ghostbusters is a really good example. You know, it's just to cash people up. There's a new Ghostbusters 3 coming out. It stars women. This is apparently terrorizing a lot of male geeks. Um, so, you know, what can you say? I think it's a sad new thing that's going to happen. So, let's go. Yeah. First, I just want to thank you for your, your courage. Thank you. Um, and thank you for... Um, and, and second, I, I just, I'm a woman who is thinking about entrepreneurial possibilities, and I just wondered if you would talk a little bit about how you financially started your, your business. I hate debt, yeah. but... Um, <laughs> I've, I've heard from other um, other women entrepreneurs that um, that sometimes that is just something that you have to take on. So if you can talk a little bit about that. I would love to talk about that. Um, I'm going to say, is that anyone's back right there? Because if it's not, I would like to kind of stand yeah. with that because I got a lot of uneasy threats. I'm so making sure he doesn't come back. He, I would appreciate that. He expresses uh, freedom of speech and he's gone. That's great. <laughs> Um, so to answer the question, um, that's a really tough one. I think structural, you know, it's like, it's like intellectually believing all people are equal is really easy, but addressing structural inequality is very, very difficult. So you start looking at women or people of different races or really anyone else, it gets really, really complicated. So if you look at, for instance, in game development, like how do people start game studios? You know, it's typically venture capital or angel money, sometimes Kickstarter gets involved. Um, you know, these are systems that are kind of famously hostile to women. So, I can tell you how I did it. Um, I didn't launch Giant Space Cat until I had an opportunity to come my way. Um, so, basically, we had a free house come our way. Um, my husband and I were paying about $2,200 a month in rent in Boston. And, you know, he's, uh, he does patent law, so he makes, uh, you know, my husband makes a good book. So we, we have this deal called Long where uh, if we redid our grandmother's house and we had like a, a hoarding disorder, we would get to live there for free for two years. So I went and sacrificed and didn't know anything about remodeling, but remodeled the entire house. So I would have that $2,200 a month to spend on launching my company. So I took it from there, and I made what you call minimally viable product. So we got the minimally viable version of Rev60, I started hiring people, and from there, it's like my success built on other successes. Does that make sense to you? So for me, I am it very slowly. Um, you know, there's a phrase, check your privilege, and here's where I've got to check my privilege. Um, you know, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. My dad, happened to launch a healthcare clinic in the 80s. His healthcare costs were exploding and did very well. So, you know, for me, um, one of the advantages I feel like I've had, which I've really been thankful for, is kind of being born into that entrepreneurial environment. So, I would say if you are a woman that wants to get really serious about launching a business, this is my perspective, that I see so many people doing it without a realistic plan. And I think coming up with capital, making political alliances, moving from there, it's the reality of how this world works. I'm a very talented software engineer, but most of my day is spent networking and taking meetings. So, you know, um, one thing I try to do personally is I, I think that when women stick together, I think we have to stick together because I think the forces are so against us. So, you know, if you want to reach out to me, like, feel free to talk to me. I'll give you advice any time. I guess for any woman that's here today, I think we're all in this together. So, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so, I'm going to preface this a little bit. I apologize. Sure. Um, just an example in my everyday experience, I had a former friend uh, sure. who played game, played a lot of film. 
Shut it. Break it. And it's an excellent game. I love it. Um, and he tweeted that it was a game for, and he used a very not nice word for gay people. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of months later, you know, I just kind of socked in and I saw that he played the Stanley Barrow. You know, very right. similar in the kind of composition, just different thematic elements, I guess. And, you know, he praised it as like this incredibly brilliant thing. And I thought that was really odd, I guess you could say. Why do you think it is that people, like, you know, are willing to see these very similar elements as being, like, you know, some kind of genius thing as long as they basically don't come from a woman? Right. That strikes me as really stupid. It's, it's stupid. And it's, it's unconscious bias. That's all it is. Like, they, I, I can't pretend to understand it, you know? I think, I don't know, I think, like, I think that it's a big industry. I think there could be games for her. So, you know, I, I just think it's unconscious bias. So I'm not sure if it's your answer that. So, uh, do we have other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I, and I'm going to be, I so admire your courage. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here talking and sharing because I don't know the game world much. I was saying to my husband, why don't we play these games? They look fun, but now you told me I'm scared. Yeah. <laughs> 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 It's not. Can I tell you? And I'll be very quick here. I, I was recently flown out to a contest in uh, France to judge some independent games. And I want to really stress, I do nothing but professional respect for these people. But I'm sitting down with someone who's a, a very famous game developer. And he's evaluating all these games. And like you pass him a game, and the game would have like 30 seconds of narration to open it. And you'll be angrily swiping at the screen, like, oh, they're making me wait for my action. This is unacceptable. And you want to get right back into the action, which is a fine point of view, but it's the majority point of view. So it is and it's not. Um, I think you can look at, I'm going to try not to get a game like super stuff here and talk more generally. I think it is, but I think games are really a crossroads. Because I think that kind of adrenaline, action, constant movement, move, 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 go, 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 is so much the norm. But you know, something I learned from my philosophy 101 class freshman year is without anything small, there cannot be anything big. Without something quiet, there cannot be something loud. So I think when you have these games that are just like, kill, go, go, all the time, I think it reaches a point where it's not exciting anymore. Yeah, I think you have to pick your moments like that. So, you know, I ultimately have faith in the marketplace. And I think that if you make games with different engineering priorities, where treating women like people instead of objects to date slash have sex with, um, I think that there's going to be a market for that. I don't think it's going to be for everyone, but I think some people are going to like it. So to me, that's the solution. So, Do we have any more questions? All right, yeah, sure. go for it, go for it. I, I really love creative writing. I'm working on writing it all right now. Um, I was chopping around the preliminary copy of, I guess you could say, of publishers. And of the five main characters in my novel, two of them are gay, two of them are women, and sure. one straight white male. Um, and a lot of them were telling me that they don't think that it will be publishable because it contains a lot of like, gay themes and a lot of like pro-female themes. In your experience, what can you person in these kind of creative industries to overcome that? I can tell you what I did with Revolution 60. Revolution 60 is a game with huge feminist overtones. Like, it's, it's, we don't talk about, like, third wave feminism, but it's, it's there, clearly. Um, I always saw it as a market differentiating feature. One of the hardest things in doing indie doubt work is getting attention. So, you know, I went out to do my vision, which is a very feminist vision from the very beginning, and it got people's attention because of that. My hiring practice, it's got me a lot of this before gamer game happened. It, it, it segmented our studio, and it made a difference. So I embrace those differences. 
And in part of it is because I believe in it, but I also think it's work in differentiation. So, you know, I'd say, I think this is where we get into like meta writing theory stuff. I think, because I wrote the script for Revolution 16, and I think if you're a writer, you have to be nakedly honest about your passions with your audience. And I think if you try to hide it, it just feels less true. So I think if that's what you feel, you're screwed. <laughs> like that's what the work is going to happen. So, you know. Awesome. Do we have any more questions? We need to wind this down. So why don't we take two more, if there are two more? Yeah. yeah. Also, thank you for coming. Yeah. Um, I, I, I remember Pac-Man. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about Miss Pac-Man and the bow. Yeah. <laughs> I've had another conversation about that. I, I played it once. I never played a video game. I, I don't know what it is. So I'm totally ignorant of this. There has to be something distinctive about gaming culture. Sure. Because we have women's soccer. We have women's basketball team, right? We have women participating in so many areas of our common culture, mm -hmm. yet are not subjected to the threats. Right. Right? Yeah. So what is it about the gaming or digital culture? Sure. Is it the anonymity that we can hide behind the username? What is it? Can you I can tell you this with science. Pardon? I, I can tell you this was scientific facts because uh -huh. um, I've wondered that a lot myself. I think we over sign, the studies show that we over subscribe uh, the, what anonymity does to the culture of gaming. It plays a role, okay. but it is not the end all be all variables. It's multifactorial. Um, look, I'm a gamer, guys. I run a gaming company. I'm not trying to bash gamers here, but I'm going to give you some facts. The facts are if you subject a child to games at a very young age, it does some things to you. Um, it slows your social development. This is a fact. It slows your ability to relate to other people. Um, studies show it doesn't cause violence, but what it does do is it stunts your empathy. Um, which makes a lot of sense, because most games are kill, 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 kill. Um, no, young children, you kind of, yeah, I was talking to Georgia Dow about this in my podcast, she's a, a psychologist, and, you know, when you're a child, the way that you interact with the world and the messages you get from them, hugely affection, like, it doesn't matter where it comes from, especially if your friends are doing it too, it really teaches you these things, so, Unfortunately, a scientific fact is if you play video games, you're going to score lower on empathy tests. Um, there is good news with that, though. Um, this is only with the current diet of video games, which tend to be this one thing. They've looked at what they call pro-social video games, games like um, Journey would be an example of one, where the gameplay is made so it can only be cooperative. They designed a game where you can only have positive interactions to help other people. And those actually increase your empathy if you do it. At least the early studies show that. So, you know, I'm hopeful that we kind of change the game of culture a little bit and basically widen the amount of games that people can play. I hope that this will solve itself. But I don't think it's rocket science. I think it's low empathy. So, I mean, clearly this person sitting here didn't feel a lot of empathy for me. So, let's do one last question. We'll move on. So, boom. Do you think, you know, on the rise, Overly violent, just to get you know the attention. Do you think games have become more violent to get grab attention? Um, I think I saw the trailer for Mortal Kombat X come out, where oh. you'll be fighting, you punch somebody, and then it X-rays into their body, and you see like their bones break and their jaw as you do it, or they will reach in and like rip out organs and you see the blood dripping off of it as they pull it out. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, this is where I have to go hyper-engineer and I start going, you know, we have had a lot more advances in specular shaving and things like that, so we want the small intestines to really look gooey. We have the power to do that now because of the specular shaving on those parts. I, I think it does. Um, but again, I, I personally, like, I'm a non-parent, 
But if I had a child, I wouldn't worry about violence so much because video games don't cause violent behavior. What I would massively worry about, and what the ESRB, you know, the regulatory thing that gives parents information to make decisions in our industry, um, it doesn't talk about sexual content or how women are represented. To me personally, it makes a lot, it's more problematic when the only role you see half the human race in is like overly busty sex objects to like, you know, tee -hee and, like, you know, the stereotype. Like, so I showed you a picture of them. So I, I think that, I think that there are a lot of problems with it, but this is also a free speech issue, you know? And you know, the truth is, every kind of game is gonna come out to the market with digital distribution. Like Hatred just came out. This is a really troubling game. You guys don't know this? It's a mass murder simulator. This is a game that's 100% about a like, white male protagonist that's so pissed off that he's gonna go out and like slash a woman and she's gonna be on her knees begging for her life and then you put the gun in her mouth and like blow her brains out and you just, that's what this game is. I can tell you for me, we have people in their forums demanding that they put me in the game so people can kill me in that game. So, you know, hatred is gonna show. You know, so I think we have to make our peace with that. But I think there's the kids' table and there's the adults' table. And I think over here at the adults' table, we can do a lot more. So I think that's it for me. Oh, wait, wait, one more. I'll let you sneak in since you got me invited. Yes. Yes, go for it. First of all, obviously, Dana, I'm so very grateful that you came here. Thank you. Um, you really have been an amazing articulate voice of um, you know, the gaming Thank you. well before you were made came after you. Um, and um, I was just going to say that I know that everyone would like to believe that this is something that just happens in the gaming industry, but it doesn't. It's not new, and it's, you know, there's a whole history of women being intimidated in jobs, and, you know, there are women in, in, in soccer and things like that, but, you know, the only space for women to play football is in lingerie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do think that there is this backlash whenever women try and step into spaces that are really, the men feel are their spaces. And, and this is something that I think is just horrifically um, been shown and you've been a horrible victim of. And uh, I hope that uh, it changes a lot online and for our society at large. I think I think we've succeeded in making games better. I need this out there. Where are you doing? So I think that's a great point to leave it on. Maybe you guys. Can